Okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining today and welcome to the Region 10 Transportation Conference of 2021. Um, today starts the, what we call webinar week, kind of the, the technical panel sessions. Um, we have one every day this week, Monday through Thursday. Um, if you weren't able to join us on Friday, we had an opening session um, and, and the recording of that will be posted to the conference website uh, later today. Uh, also on the conference website, you can find information and re uh, registration links for the other three technical sessions during webinar week, tomorrow through Thursday, um, as well as a virtual poster session and some announcements about some annual awards that PACTRANS gives out. Um, so without further ado, let's get started with today's session titled The Changing Travel Demand and Mode Choice of Commuters During and Post-COVID-19 Pandemic. Um, I'd like to introduce today's session organizer moderator. Ching Shen is a professor of, of urban design and planning here at the University of Washington. So Ching, I will allow inter, or invite you to turn on your camera, come on up and um, introduce our speakers for the day. Thank you, Carl. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for your participation in this session of the annual conference of PAC Trends. Um, today, we are excited to have uh, three uh, presentations uh, from a diverse group of people. Um, and we will introduce them one by one when each comes up. But uh, in general, as uh, you uh, must have been noticing that as the US is striving to recover from the devastations of the pandemic, the commuter, uh, the commute presents a great challenge for employees, employers, and transit providers, as well as academic researchers like us. And I think this session, um, the presentations will um, facilitate good communications among all stakeholders in terms of how we carve a path towards a hopefully uh, better transportation future. And uh, with that, I would like to um, first introduce our first speaker, um, Melissa Brown, who is the TDM programs uh, development specialist working at the University of Washington's Transportation Services. And um, Melissa has been working with PACTRAN team um, collaboratively on a research project. Uh, and uh, her presentation today is entitled Commuting Hardships for Essential Workers during the COVID pandemic, lessons for transportation planning. Melissa, take away. Thank you, Ching. Let me share my screen. All right, so like uh, Ching mentioned, my name is Melissa Brown. I am the uh, Transportation Demand Management Program Development Specialist with the University of Washington uh, Transportation Services Department. And today I'll be talking about uh, commuting experience and hardships for essential workers during COVID-19. So this, uh, this presentation is a culmination of a collaborative project uh, between researchers at the University of Washington, as well as University of Washington Transportation Services Department. So investigators of this project include uh, Chen Chen, uh, Jeff Ban, and Brene Mudon, as well as PhD, PhD students, Lamise Ashur, Ming Ming Kai, and Yi Wan Wang. Um, and I joined as more of a liaison between the researchers and the Transportation Services Department, as well as a uh, program implementer um, as we're hoping to take some of these findings and um, implement uh, some of our recommendations and policies moving forward. 
So the objectives of our research were to understand how app application-based uh, shared mobility options can improve the commute, as well as to explore um, the commuting experience of essential workers to inform post-pandemic transportation planning using the University of Washington as a case study. Um, now, the UW was selected as a case study uh, in part because we have over 70,000 commuters who travel to campus on a daily basis uh, during non-COVID times. Um, and as uh, the, given the size of our campus, we're actively working towards reducing our single occupancy vehicle uh, or drive alone rate to meet city mandates by 2028. So, um, you know, we are very interested in understanding, um, you know, the what and the why behind uh, how and why folks commute and um, what programs or policies we can implement to, to folks more towards sustainable commute options. So the study consists of two components. Uh, the first is a quantitative analysis of the uh, transportation needs assessment study that was conducted by the Transportation Services Department back in fall of 2020, as well as a qualitative analysis uh, based on a series of focus group discussions with UW employees that was conducted this summer in June and July of 2021. We'll start with sharing about the findings of our quantitative analysis. Um, and as we explored this, um, you know, we, we focused on how do different demographic groups make uh, choice, their choices for commuting before and during COVID-19, and what was their pattern of commuting mode shift during COVID? Uh, and further, uh, what socio-demographic variables were significantly associated with commuter mode choice during COVID-19? And how do these variables affect the probabilities of choosing different modes? As for our methodology, um, as we were analyzing data that was collected by the UW Transportation Services Needs Assessment Study, um, we first classified respondents by the mode that they used, whether they were public transit, carpool or van pool users, or if they predominantly drove alone, or if they used non-motorized transport like biking and walking. And then uh, we explored uh, commute mode choice for different demographic groups through descriptive statistics. Um, and finally, we've used discrete choice models to explore how these socioeconomic characteristics are associated with mode choices both before and during COVID-19. Starting with some, some data highlights, one of the first elements we looked at was mode choice and household annual income. Um, we'll be focusing on employee commute behavior, uh, given our focus for um, our analysis was specifically on essential workers during COVID-19, which the university defined as, um, you know, essentially folks that were continuing to travel to campus uh, for the duration of the pandemic um, and had uh, little to no flexibility with telework during this time. So um, one of the first key findings was that, um, you know, looking at the distribution of different incomes, the pandemic uh, ultimately caused many employees, especially those who fall into higher income groups to switch away from public transit and carpool uh, which predominantly uh, became the mode choice for lower income groups that were continuing to travel to campus during COVID-19. And further, we also saw that biking and walking, as well as driving alone, um, were more resilient modes during the pandemic and the distribution um, of using these modes among the different income groups was, was more stable uh, when comparing um, their use across these two different timelines. Um, so it was ultimately public transit, carpool, and van pool, these shared mobility options that saw the most shift and change uh, as a result of the pandemic. One of the next elements that we looked at was um, mode choice and car ownership. Um, so uh, the main finding from this was that among employees that continued to travel to campus 
using transit during COVID-19, um, these employees were less likely to own a car when um, compared to the full population of employees traveling to campus before COVID. Um, you know, these findings suggest that this group that was, uh, you know, essential workers tra continuing to travel to campus during the pandemic is more likely to be transit dependent um, and highlights the need for um, programming to support, uh, you know, their commutes um, both during the pandemic, but also in the post-pandemic commute. So as part of this uh, analysis, again, of our survey results, we also um, conducted a multinomial logistic model of significant demographic variables associated with mode choice during COVID-19. Some of the main highlights that we found were that um, white folks were more likely to choose biking and walking than other racial groups. Um, we also saw that having a high household income, as well as car ownership and distance live from campus were all significantly associated with mode choice during COVID-19. Um, and then we also saw that the high income group was more likely to choose driving, biking, and walking for their commute instead of taking public transit, carpool, or vanpool during the pandemic. Um, and we finally saw that um, these results show the distance lived from campus um, did not make a significant difference between uh, the odds ratio of choosing driving alone compared to public transit. However, it may lead to lower probability of choosing biking and walking as the distance lived from campus increases. As part of this, um, we also looked towards um, you know, visualizing this probability for um, mode choice between um, a high income group and non high income group during COVID-19. Um, and from this visual, we can see that for people with high household incomes who lived within five to 35 miles of campus, they had significantly higher probabilities of choosing to drive alone. Um, however, for folks who um, had a household income of less than $100,000 per year, um, this preference towards driving alone is not as pronounced as we see among the high income group. Some conclusions from this initial quantitative analysis was that the, the pandemic increased mode shift towards driving alone, which was again, most pronounced within these high income groups. Um, we also saw that income level, car ownership and distance live from campus were significantly associated with mode choice during COVID. Um, and finally, uh, during COVID, those folks with high incomes who lived within that five to 35 mile distance from campus had significantly higher probability of choosing to drive alone. And the next element of our project was to conduct a qualitative analysis, um, which consisted of a series of focus groups uh, with UW employees. So some of the questions that we explored were, how did uh, COVID impact transit riders' perception of different commute modes and how did that impact their commute mode choice? Um, we also looked at how, um, you know, under what conditions will staff shift from other commute modes such as driving alone or non-motorized travel and switch to transit carpooling post-pandemic? And finally, what can institutions, meaning employers or educational institutions, and transit agencies do to facilitate the use of transit and carpooling, especially in this post-pandemic environment that we're in. As for our methodology, um, we conducted a series of four focus groups uh, online with 21 staff members who self-identified as transit or vanpool riders before the pandemic. Um, we did have representation from both professional staff and contract classified staff uh, across this university employee group. Um, and we continued to hold these focus groups until we reached uh, adequate diversity of participants. 
As for the analysis portion, uh, we ultimately used a software system uh, to support with the transcription of the focus groups, as well as coding and analysis of common focus group themes that arose during these discussions. Um, some quick demographics about the uh, focus group participants that we spoke with. Um, they were predominantly living outside of Seattle. Um, there was a wide distribution of ages across these employee groups, um, but the majority fell within the 30 to 65 year old age group. Um, the majority of focus group participants identified as female, it's around 62%. And again, uh, we discussed that we had representation from both the uh, professional staff and contract classified groups within the university employee group. And um, this is just a quick overview of um, the commute modes used by these participants during COVID-19. So we discussed that um, these participants had self-identified as being uh, predominantly transit or carpool riders before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, they were predominantly using transit or choosing to drive alone. Uh, we also saw a wide distribution of commute durations before COVID with the majority falling within this 30 to 60 minute uh, commute duration. As for some of the takeaways from these conversations, um, we framed a lot of our conversations uh, about um, how folks traveled uh, before the pandemic and um, you know, how their perceptions of their travel changed during the pandemic. So some of the themes that we, that we commonly heard, and these are weighted by the mentions in the chart uh, here, is um, some of the advantages of using transit before the pandemic. Uh, common themes that came up were the value of travel time, cost of using transit, and general access to transit. Uh, in their area. However, disadvantages that uh, commonly came up by the focus group participants were that there were issues with reliability of smartphone applications and real-time information. Um, routes were often busy or crowded, and there were significant challenges with schedules, um, you know, with transit schedules, uh, especially as it related to those who had to uh, make a transfer at some point during their commute. Um, other themes that came up in um, when framing our conversation about uh, perceptions before the pandemic included barriers to carpooling. Some of the challenges we, we heard about were that folks had concerns about carpooling just due to schedule constraints, um, concerns around social interaction or carpooling with strangers, as well as perception about um, dependability issues uh, should they choose to carpool. And we also heard some common challenges about driving alone, including um, the high cost, uh, availability of parking on and around campus, uh, as well as issues related to stress and traffic. However, we saw uh, a lot of these perceptions shift when asking about, you know, how do you feel about using these modes during the pandemic? Um, for transit, common themes we, we heard uh, related to challenges include reliability, um, especially as many transit services um, shifted their shifted or reduced their schedules uh, during the pandemic, uh, perceptions of safety issues as well as compliance issues among other riders uh, with the health and safety measures in place. Um, and finally, there were challenges with frequency. Um, we also heard, however, there were more perceived advantages of driving alone during the pandemic including that uh, it was perceived as safe, uh, fast. There was a period in which the university was offering uh, free parking in a specific lot. Um, and some of these uh, focus group respondents also found driving alone to be a more attractive option um, if they had any flexibility to telework as part of their role. Um, if they were traveling to campus less often, they may choose to drive alone more often. So some of the conclusions um, from this qualitative portion were that um, you know, we, we heard that most riders switched away from transit during the first few months of the pandemic due to safety and reliability issues. 
Um, however, once vaccines became available, uh, cost, schedule, and frequency became primary factors for mode choice. Um, and these riders that permanently switched to driving alone or reported that they would were predominantly living outside of Seattle or parents with caregiving responsibilities and had flexibility to telework as part of their role. Um, and we also heard from, from respondents that monetary incentives such as a fully subsidized U-Pass, which is our university transit pass, discounted carpool parking and free or guaranteed park and ride parking might facilitate mode switch to transit or carpool. Um, and finally, uh, the, the focus group respondents felt that a smartphone application uh, created by the university related to transportation information would be redundant unless it provided access to real-time updates. So with these conclusions in mind, um, the research group developed a series of policy recommendations um, dependent on sort of which stage of the pandemic we were in. During the early stage of the pandemic, um, some of the recommendations were to implement provisions to support all modes, uh, including driving, um, just to support folks in for folks, including essential workers in getting to campus, especially if other modes were perceived as unsafe or unreliable. Um, second, that transit agencies should maintain reliable service for those who are transit dependent and continue to provide access to real time information, especially if service levels are changing. Um, and third, uh, there's a need for further coordination of uh, commuting needs for essential workers and the development um, and strengthening of channels for communicating those needs uh, to transit agencies. Um, and then of course, as vaccines became available, there was certainly a need for timely adjustments of policies to better address the evolution of the pandemic and the shifts in travel patterns associated with it. Um, and as we plan for post-pandemic recovery, um, you know, it's important to consider policies that continue to encourage shared modes such as transit or carpooling. Um, in our case, uh, from what we heard from respondents was there's interest in expanding the fully subsidized U-Pass program, um, looking at um, how we can provide access to free or guaranteed park and ride parking or reduced cost of carpool parking and looking at various means to uh, encourage the use of transit and carpool. Um, and that is the last of uh, my presentation. Um, I will quit sharing, but wanted to uh, thank you all and the, uh, the research group with the University of Washington for the collaboration on this project. We look forward to seeing where, where we go next with it. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, let's see if there is one or maximum two quick questions. Uh, we will leave about 10 minutes at the end of uh, everybody's, uh, after everybody's presentation uh, to um, uh, have a, another session of uh, question and answer. But right now, any question? Okay, I, I do not see anybody um, either typing into chat or raise the hand. So I assume that we will come back to, Melissa, did you see any? Um, okay, so then we will um, uh, go to the next presentation for now. Thank you very much again, Melissa. So our next uh, topic of presentation is a scenario modeling of return to work in the Puget Sound area. And it is uh, uh, going to be co-presented by Professor Jeff Ban, who is the William and Marilyn Connor endowed professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at the University of Washington. And Bryce Nichols, who is a senior modeler working for the Puget Sound Regional Council. So Jeff and, uh, and the Bryce. Oh, thank you, um, Ching. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so Bryce and I will be happy to present um, this project. Um, let me share the screen first. Um,
So this is an ongoing um, project that uh, mainly uh, PSRC and UW are conducting um, now uh, with uh, um, support and the funding uh, support, especially from uh, China Seattle, who is uh, um, coordinator of, of this project and uh, putting everything together, and also Sun Transit and uh, King County Metro providing um, you know, a huge input to this project and also the some of the financial support. So, um, so we'll um, talk about why we do this and uh, you know the research method, uh, especially we uh, did a lot of you know reviews uh, uh, of the surveys and other data, uh, mobility data included, and uh, based on these two design scenarios, uh, which I'm going to talk about this too. And Bryce will take over to talk about how to run the PSRC model to generate some of the scenarios and results and the major fundings. And I will then uh, come back to um, you know um, conclude the uh, the project uh, for now, other presentation for now. Um, so, um, as we all know that um, back to April or May of this year, when the vaccination, you know, is, uh, you know, massive max, uh, vaccination rollout, and uh, uh, I think people in the U.S. were very optimistic at that time that, you know, the COVID will end and uh, everything will back to normal. And uh, during that time, uh, many businesses are reconsidering their telecommuting policies and uh, many are planning to go back to work for their employees. You know, examples including, you know, Amazon, Google and others are setting the, were, were setting the, uh, you know, target date like uh, October for their employees to go, go back to work. Um, and uh, there are, of course, many uncertainties regarding how they're going to, uh, you know, go back to their offices and uh, what's the impact to transit and uh, the transportation in general. So this is mainly the motivation at, during that time that we, we, we had a conversation with Comotion of UW, with uh, PSRC, with uh, China Seattle, and also Metro and Sun Transit, uh, and try to figure out, you know, if there's uh, a way that we can sort of uh, do this uh, assessment, do these scenarios. Of course, we know, we knew at the very beginning that this is a huge uncertainty regarding how the pandemic uh, would evolve and the, the kind of resulting uh, return to work plans and transit uses and things like that. So we that's kind of considered in the a scenario design as we, we can see. Um, so this is sort of the motivation and uh, you know why we took uh, took this on. Um, the approach is essentially you know we by looking at what has been done, like, you know, for example, Melissa uh, talk about some of the surveys and interviews and uh, focus groups um, as, that has been conducted at UW, we, we were aware of that there were many other uh, surveys and data collections and uh, studies regarding um, particularly the, uh, you know, the commuting or the travel behavior changes during COVID and uh, some of the questions regarding what's going to happen after COVID um, and also businesses return to, uh, to work plans. So we basically, uh, a huge part of this is to look at what has been done, what the data has been collected, uh, both in terms of surveys, interviews, focus groups, and also the mobility data. Uh, we also some of the details. And based on this data analysis, we try to synthesize mainly two aspects, you know, how businesses plan to return to work of their employees and also how people's uses of transit may change after COVID. And based on that, we design our scenarios, and uh, then we input the scenario into um, PSRC planning model uh, with some um, suncast. And uh, we run the model <coughs> to generate how the transportation impact and also the transit use uh, from those kind of input. Um, so this is sort of the kind of the um, uh, flowchart of the uh, approach that we, uh, we've been taking uh, from there. Um, I talk about um, some of the uh, results of, we do the review of the surveys and also the mobility data. Um, and then based on, but based on that, how we design our scenarios. So um, essentially, as I sort of uh, indicated, um, the, the data that we have uh, been looking at, uh, including the surveys and interviews and focus groups data that, um, you know, the next slide I will provide a list of those. And also we look at the mobility data. So this is the, um, the surveys and interviews and other type of, uh, you know, uh, data that we have uh, looked into, including the survey um, data that Melissa presented earlier. Um, so uh, notice that this is 
um, up to maybe the April and May of this year because this project was conducted uh, over the summer. Um, so the, as you can see from this list, it's included um, the surveys or interviews interviews conducted by academia researchers like many UW uh, uh, colleagues and also agencies like PSRC, like Metro, and also the, um, um, the uh, no-profit uh, organization like uh, Community Seattle or um, China Seattle, right? So it's a collection of those um, surveys and uh, um, interviews that we look into the details and try to figure out uh, some of the aspects that relevant to this project. Um, so the mobility data, we looked at mainly the Metro and Sun Transit, uh, you know, their boarding, their ridership data um, as the, from mainly 2018 all the way to uh, May of, or even a little bit later of 2021 to look at the trend. And also, you know, Google, Apple, and some other um, data providers also pr published this kind of mobility data during COVID. That's also give us some kind of insight about how the mobility changes uh, during this period. Um, so without um, going into many of the details, uh, I do have some backup slides to show some of the detailed results, but I just wanted to share using two slides um, uh, about the major kind of findings from those reviews. The first one is essentially how the return to work plan. Notice that this is um, at the time early July when we conducted this project. It certainly didn't uh, capture the later development in this in this in this process. Um, so we noticed that um, uh, definitely, uh, although if you look at the first panel on the left, although uh, when during that time a quarter of the surveyed companies regarding their return to work plan, the sort of um, hoped uh, total return to plan 100, 100% employees going back to office, but you can see a majority, more than half of the em employers expected some sort of hybrid, like a couple of days a week being in office and uh, you know the, the other days you basically can tele telework, right? So that's sort of the, the main kind of uh, um, trend in this regard. And But this um, happens to be um, kind of, uh, uh, heterogeneous in terms of very um, different, if you look at different industry sectors, if you look at different geographic areas, like for example, in uh, the King County or the greater Seattle area, because the IT company is a uh, dominant uh, in this area uh, or has a large portion, then, you know, the telecommuting portion will be higher, but compared with other counties. And, uh, you know, if you look at different industry sectors, then um, since can be very different, like if you look at the hotel and other industries, their return to work portions may be lower than the, um, the rest of the industry sectors. Um, and also we look at, we, we feel that um, as uh, people looking at the post pandemic uh, scenarios, they certainly have, you know, if, uh, that's a so-called staggered return to work, right? So by the end of the year, then they, they expect uh, maybe, you know, as we can see from here, about two thirds of companies expect maybe, okay, 75% of the workforce going back to work. Um, but if you look at longer horizon that 2022 and 2023, maybe more, right? So they expect sort of the uh, opening like more and more as we, um, we go. Um, certainly this was in early July and, uh, you know, we know that uh, companies because of Delta variant, so many of them kind of re reverse back to telecommuting. Um, that's, uh, we, we, we were, that's sort of the uncertainty that we, we talked uh, a little later. Um, so regarding transit usage, um, we know that um, transit has been dramatically reduced in terms of ridership uh, during COVID, but um, the survey shows that as people kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, expecting the post-pandemic uh, 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 era, then, um, you know, they expect that, you know, uh, the transit use will be, uh, be, be, uh, be, be uh, sort of recovered from that uh, period. Um, again, it's also... Um, different, um, if you look at different uh, geographic areas, like the, uh, the four counties in the Peterson area, well, so different um, people's kind of sort of uh, plan to uh, use transit can be dramatically different. And also the most of like uh, we noticed uh, even uh, not only during COVID, but even post COVID, there's a percentage which has a huge range from zero to 25% of those who, sur who were surveyed to show that, okay, they're basically switched from transit to other modes, mainly the, you know, the driving alone kind of mode, right? Um, and another last point is that um, uh, as 
vaccination has been, uh, you know, a, a, a large portion in the nation and people sold um, confidence that, you know, if they are vaccinated, then they be more willing to take transit, which, you know, we, we have seen that trend uh, recently. So those two are the major sort of uh, um, fundings or results or synthesized from these two aspect, one is the transit use, another one is the return to work sort of plan. And these numbers, you know, we have some nominal numbers, will be the foundation for us to set up the scenarios, right? So the scenarios will essentially we look at, okay, how businesses um, um, still plan for their commuters to work from home, right? That's kind of telecommuting and the rest will go back to work. And also the sort of the transit um, switch to SOA because we saw that uh, might be also a significant impact uh, after COVID. Um, so the scenario design will, we, we have a baseline, which is 2018. Uh, then we, we are, because there's a staggered reopening. So we saw maybe we look at the short term, which is the end of 2021 and the, the midterm will be 2022 or 2023, right? So for, um, you know, either the short term or, or, or the, Medium term, we will look at because of the uncertainties. We know that COVID, you know, has been, you know, nobody knows uh, at that time what is going to happen. The Delta, although at that time was not a major concern in the U.S., but we know since may um, make become um, severe or not, depending on how the uh, virus, um, you know, uh, evolves. So we basically say because of this uncertainty, we will design three scenarios: mainly optimistic, <coughs> neutral, <coughs> excuse me, um, or pessimistic. Uh, this is regarding how the virus will evolve and how people's attitude regarding using transit or regarding uh, return to work will change, right? So that's sort of their attitude on that. And uh, you want to capture the most congested um, period of the day, like we design also this work day, like uh, um, that's me that try to capture a uh, majority of the workforce going to work, let's say Tuesdays or Wednesdays, and then people switch to from transit to SLV and what's the impact uh, of that. Um, <clears throat> so just quick uh, comment regarding, you know, these two major parameters regarding the uh, return to work or the commuters uh, work from home and also the transit switch to um, SOV, um, they are both impact uh, transit uses, right? So this is uh, so that, um, you know, um, both will reduce the transit use and uh, um, if people switch to SOV, then uh, that's the consequence will be the increasing of the, um, you know, the driving on, and travel times on the on the uh, road network. Um, so here we can see that for the short term, particularly, um, we have, you know, based on these two parameters, you know, optimistic scenarios, we were sort of, um, this is an educated guess based on the survey results, about 30% of the commuters still will work from home and 70% going to work, right? That's sort of the one scenario. And regarding the transit use, um, you know, optimistic means there's, you know, people will switch to transit and there's no switch from transit to SOA. But, you know, if you look at neutral and pessimistic, we have a um, similar uh, corresponding kind of parameters for these two. Okay, so um, I think that's sort of the scenarios, the two major parameters we designed based on the survey. And then <clears throat> a breath will take over to uh, look into the run the models and also the uh, some of the major results. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, so let me just briefly describe what Soundcast is. It's an activity-based travel model, um, which means it's a micro simulation of everyone's daily activity patterns, the trips that they make throughout the day. Uh, the core of this model is a set of behavioral choices that are made and then simulated, um, right? And we get a list of trips uh, that people take throughout their day. Um, and that ends up being on a specific set of roads or transit networks um, that are chosen at the end of the model. Um, so ultimately, Jeff, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, the things that we get out of the model um, are basically the conditions on the roadway and, you know, transit ridership. Um, on various routes and lines. So we have those results at the hourly level and we aggregate them up um, because this is really disaggregate information from individual trip levels for each household and person. Um, so we can take a look at all those results at, at different levels of aggregation. Um, and so in these scenarios, we usually will send the results of the traffic assignments, the choices that happen back into the decisions that get made in the model. But for this example, we kind of wanted to test a first order level of impacts by asserting all of these changes in the scenarios that Jeff described. So different levels of people working from home um, and switching to 
SOV from transit um, as a response to the pandemic. So these are fed directly into assignment. So it's not particularly adjusting everyone's behavior to what we have seen. It's just more a way to check magnitudes and differences between various levels of working from home and switching to, to different modes. So um, let's go ahead and jump into the results and I'll cover some of the um, kind of trends overall. So first looking at, at transit boardings where we see the biggest, um, the most direct connection where we asserted that people are going to work from home and then also they're going to switch out of transit. We see pretty large impacts ranging from, you know, a fifth to a half uh, of people no longer taking transit in these different scenarios. And they vary slightly across different agencies, um, obviously more commuter focused um, rides tend to have a bigger impact. So you can see Washington ferries, um, fewer riders as people are going across town um, into downtown Seattle specifically. But a lot of uh, transit riders are also taking trips for non-commute purposes too. So it's kind of interesting to see these boardings as we look through these results and see where the differences are in the resiliency of commuters versus other users. So we can see that in the next slide if we go to that. A um, lot of detailed information here, but what we did is looked at um, the geography of boardings and it's pretty consistent overall because a lot of folks that are commuting to downtown Seattle are coming from all over the place. And in our scenarios, we randomly selected people to be working from home and didn't particularly um, focus on any industry. It was just kind of every across the board decreases, but you do see places that see larger drops such as, you know, parts of South King County um, and some of East King County. These are more areas that are, their, their transit service is more commuter focused. So you see bigger impacts when you remove trips that are work from home. So this is one way to kind of to identify that. The next slide shows individual transit lines. So, you know, from the results, we can really dig into some of these results, but um, the highest level um, boardings are the ones we really like to focus on since this is a, a regional model. Soundcast is not particularly something you should dig into individual lines for, but for the biggest riderships, um, biggest ridership lines, like all the rapid ride routes, you can compare those to what's happening with um, Sound Transit's Sounder services, which is heavily commuter focused um, and can see big differences there that kind of tell us the same story. Um, and overall, you can kind of see the magnitude of impacts of ridership pretty directly on all these different scenarios. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, the next thing that we looked at was, you know, aside from boardings, was the actual amount of vehicle miles that are traveled on the network. Um, so this is the magnitude of all of these impacts um, is less than the boardings you see. And that's because in the scenarios, we assert that a certain number of um, commuters are going to switch from transit to driving. So the lower, uh, the VMT impacts are, you know, kind of lower because there's additional people on the road at this point. Um, and it's a little bit more of a convoluted issue on this one because of the way that the scenarios are designed to really understand, you know, exactly what's happening here. Um, there's a couple kind of explanations that we could dig into, but, um, but overall, you can still see that um, VMT drops in all of the scenarios that we took a look at. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things to look at the geography and then the types of places and trying to think through what the reasons are for why that may not have dropped more or why it may not increase more in some situations, um, but it's a little bit of a, a complex process, process, like a lot of things that are happening inside of the travel demand model and the choices people make. It's a little challenging to tease out exactly what's happening there. Um, let's go to the next slide here. So, you know, if we look at things at a little bit of a higher level and look at the by time of day, um, a lot of these results make sense. Most of the um, decrease and VMT from these scenarios from people driving less is happening in the morning peak, which is traditionally when people are commuting um, the most, except the PM commute is also the return trip, but you also have a lot of other trips that are happening at the same time. That's why the PM peak is the most congested time of day because you have people returning from work to go home, but also stopping to do other things and then participating in other activities. So um, pretty expected and straightforward results here for the VMT. Let's go to the next one here. So one of the things we looked at again was this kind of geographic distribution, like we did for the boardings, but we wanted to look at specific locations, um, you know, throughout the throughout the region. Um, and so what we see here is that everywhere has a drop in VMT from all of these scenarios, but the place that drops the least 
which you can think of as being the place that actually generates the most traffic would be downtown Seattle in some of these scenarios. That's because if we're shifting people from transit to SOV modes, like we are in the scenarios, there's a lot of transit going to downtown Seattle. So it sees the largest VMT increase um, and corresponding delay because of that. All right, next slide. Um, and speaking of delay, so we can take a look at the delay overall. The um, the change in delay looks pretty significant for these scenarios, as you might expect by having large amounts of people working from home. Even with the shifting from transit um, to SOV, overall taking people's longest trips off of the network um, is going to significantly re reduce delay. Uh, that being said, there's still a ton of delay on the system, right? 2018 was a very highly congested time, which I don't know if we've all just forgot about, but it was it was pretty bad to try to commute to downtown Seattle um, on the roadways. And just in general, everywhere, there was, there was a lot of congestion. Um, so even with these scenarios, you take a lot of people that and have them work from home, there's still quite a bit of delay, even in all these scenarios. Um, let's see, do we have another slide on this? There's one more. Okay, well, those are the main points from that we wanted to kind of go through. We didn't have tons of time to dig in, but there's all kinds of interesting results that we've been looking at and talking about and trying to understand exactly what's happening. Um, and again, this is kind of the first first order type test is what I like to think of is we'd really like to make the complex, the model more complex and look into the, the relationships and choices people are making. But this is just an initial, let's change the trips, assign them to the network and see what that level of magnitude looks like under different scenario assumptions. All right, um, thank you, Bryce. Um, I just uh, use one minute to sort of sum, um, summarize, um, you know, the major takeaways is uh, both the commuter working from home and the transit riders switching to SOV will change the uh, transit user network performance. And it's from what we have studied so far, the commuters working from home have a bigger impact. But for those um, areas that um, transit um, you know, has a significant role or the, you know, the transit uh, is a, a major mode um, in that area like downtown Seattle, then the, you know, the, the, the transit switch to SOV also have an impact, um, which is significant. That's sort of what we have seen from the, from some of the results. And uh, we also recognize the limitations of the work because we, you know, we based on basically the survey data up to April or May, try to Use that data, synthesize it, and try to pro project what's going to happen uh, by the end of the year, right? So, you can guess um, this is, um, um, you know, it's at the best educated guess regarding how the sense will change. And uh, for that reason, we have designed different scenarios to capture, you know, the, how the situ situations may evolve. And uh, the four scenarios give us, you know, uh, if the you know the COVID had changed in different paths, and how the um, results may look like. Um, and also the modeling tools so far hasn't considered, you know, if uh, for a significant portion of commuters uh, work from home, they may have some, you know, um, um, associated trips, but we, this is not really captured in the model. Um, and uh, because of this, you know, we mainly capture the major trend, not the, you know, details of some of, you know, numbers. Me, we look at the trend, not the exact numbers. That's what I try to say. Um, so we are still, um, you know, an analyzing the results, some of the details, and also the next step is to work with our partners to design the middle term scenarios. We are closely looking at what's going on and try to sort of predict what's going to happen in the next year or the year after. Um, and for this, we need to sort of capture the behavior, um, you know, the, the, during this. Uh, process, uh, especially people's travel behavior when they work from home. Um, I think that's sort of wrap up um, the presentation. Um, and uh, um, sorry, it took a little bit longer, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, um, thank you, Jeff and Bryce. Um, given the interest of time, let's uh, leave the questions towards the end. Okay, so I would like mm -hmm. to go to strict forwardly to Kelly. Um, Kelly's um, uh, uh, the third topic of the pre uh, of the session is thoughts on com on the commute, and um, uh, by Kelly Costa. 
Uh, Kelly is uh, a graduate of uh, UDA's Urban Design and Planning um, Department's Master of Urban Planning program, and she's the Director of Marketing for Loom. Uh, Kelly, please take her away. Yeah, hi everyone, and thanks again for having me here today. Um, Ching gave a, a perfect intro there. I'm a proud graduate of the MUP program at UW and now find myself in the tech sector. So I work at Loom. We are a commute software. Um, so we are basically the software that powers the policies that employers want to implement um, regarding commute. Our, our whole shtick is trying to get fewer people driving alone to work. We care about that for congestion, urban life, experience of commuting, environment. Employers care about it for that, but really for the fact that parking is really expensive. <laughs> so they work with us. Um, we primarily work with universities, hospitals, and major employers. Um, we work with over 500,000 commuters in the Seattle region. Um, so if you think of the major employers in this area that are headquartered here, they're, they're probably our customer. Um, so today I'm just going to share a few data points, very light compared to how the others have gone in depth on what commuting looked like in the past year. I'll share some employee survey findings from a survey we did with our parent company a couple months ago on what employees are thinking about returning to work. And then I'll finally, I'll, I'll close with some information about research we're doing with Duke's Center for Advanced Hindsight and Vanderbilt University, um, which is the fun stuff in my opinion. So I'm gonna go quicker through the first bit so we can spend more time in that behavior change research at the end. So first, just one slide here. As transportation professionals, none of this should surprise you given the last presentations. Think of this as just reinforcing data. But in Loom's data with our commuters um, across North America and Canada and the US, we've seen a 60% drop in commute trips, the biggest at tech companies dropping 85% um, over this time and, and still to this day, and compared to just 20% drop in healthcare. One interesting tidbit we found in healthcare specifically is that there's twice as many people carpooling and van pooling at healthcare compared to busing uh, during the pandemic, whereas in January of 2020, this, this trend was flipped, where there were twice as many busing as there were carpooling and van pooling. So it'll be interesting moving forward to see if that sticks um, or if those people go back to busing. And lastly, we've seen the biggest spike in biking at universities. And I think during the pandemic, I, I would venture a guess to say that's due to, you know, age and ability of a university students, the budgeting, you know, biking is, if you can get a bike, it's then free from there on out, um, and then naturally living closer to campus. So there's been so many surveys. I heard Jeff mention this too, about, about what's the post-COVID commute going to look like? How's it going to be different? Um, I really just put this on here to sort of rant about what does post-COVID even mean? I think these surveys are always taking into account different contexts. The context is continually changing. It's different depending on the region that you're in, um, depending on your stance on vaccines or the pandemic in general. So I really just like to think about what is the future commute and how will that look different? You know, what has happened during this pandemic like that has influenced um, how people commute, such as teleworking, such as e-bike sales booming, and then how looking closely like, like Bryce and uh, Jeff's study there is how is transit rebounding? Definitely that is a focus. So now let me dive into just a few of the findings from the employee survey that our parent company did. So our parent company is Health Equity and they're an employee benefits company overall. So what I found most interesting about this survey is how commuting <laughs> rose to the top, even though they were asking about all sorts of different benefits, any benefit under the sun, people, employees are thinking about the commute. So this survey was done in June of 2021. We just looked at this 43% that's highlighted here of the study, which is people like myself who prior to the pandemic commuted into the office basically full-time during the pandemic are either full-time remote or in some sort of hybrid remote 
working capacity. So it was just over a thousand employees that represent this 43% of the study. And we wanna see what, you know, how have their preferences changed? What are they thinking about with regards to returning to offices? The key takeaways from the survey were employees value flexibility above anything else. That's why you see major companies like Amazon, like Google who have, who have always had a stance of like, we like people to be in the office. That's how you collaborate. You know, we make it an experience when you're here. We serve you breakfast, lunch, and dinner, et cetera. You see them even saying, okay, okay, you can be hybrid or you can even be maybe fully remote as long as you can commute into the office if you need to be there. So it's really interesting to see that perception change as employees start to demand flexibility. Um, so we see the remote work will become important. And then as I alluded, the opportunity to improve the commute really rose as well from this survey. What we see in the survey too is that 74% of those you know, who have moved to some sort of remote or part-time remote during the pandemic, 74% of them have plans to bring their employees back to work, either part in a hybrid working model or full-time. And the employees, two thirds of them, so not quite matching that, that three quarters, but almost want to return to the office at least part of the time. I know I prefer a hybrid model, which before the pandemic, I would have said I prefer to be in the office every day, all the time. And definitely the last 18, 19 months has changed that for me. So then this is what I found incredibly interesting about this survey. Again, asking about all benefits under the sun, including I like to work from home because I can wear sweatpants, because of childcare, because of my comfortable workspace, because of flexibility, all of that's on the table. And the two things that ranked the highest among those who wanted to work remote either full-time or part of the time was because of commuting time and commuting cost. So where we're really working with employers now, both both our partners and our maybe future partners, is how can you reframe the time spent commuting to be repurposed for better ways for your employees? So it's not a stressful single occupancy vehicle commute, but instead it's reading a book on the bus or train, it's socializing in a carpool van pool, checking your emails in any of those modes. It's not driving alone. Uh, don't do that. Uh, and then we're also really working with costs because that one that one's easy, right? If you can offer a subsidy, you can offer incentives, free transit cards, um, rewards, all sorts of gamification or just straight up incentives and money um, specific to sustainable modes, you know, specific to not driving alone. And we're really treating this with with the partners that we have as an opportunity for change because we know that that's when people, when you can change behaviors is when you move or start a new job or there's a serious disruption, which I think we all agree that this has been a serious disruption the last 19 months to our lives. Um, so we frame it as sort of we're all relocating back to a new office. It probably has a new floor plan. It could be downsized. You know, you could be only going in a couple of days a week. Here's a bunch of our customers announcing their plans that influence a lot of other people. Um, and so we're, what we're really happy about is that employers are changing their benefits to be more flexible, which is, of course, something that we have always, as, as TDM professionals, known we need more flexible benefits to change behaviors. And so we're really happy to see that that's, that that's occurring with employers, um, sort of because they, they feel they must. Um, we don't care why they're doing it, we'll take it. <laughs> um, and so the biggest change we're seeing, again, making our TDM hearts flutter, is this switch to daily parking charges. So there's quite a few employers that we've, you know, that have, we've wanted to switch for a long time, or even they've wanted to. And this moment, this hybrid workplace, this you can't charge someone for a monthly permit if they're only coming in two days a week, has finally gotten the organizational approval um, to change that, to change the way that they manage parking to the way that they offer all their commute benefits um, and switching to daily parking charges. We're really happy about that from the partners that we have who have switched from monthly paid permits to daily paid permits. 
on average in the first year, we see like a 12 to 15% reduction in drive alone rates, which is amazing. This does not take into account the price. Um, all of those have different price levels. Some of them are market rate, some of them are subsidized heavily by the employer. So just looking at who's made that switch away from a monthly paid permit to a daily paid permit. So we're very excited to see more people doing that um, in, in the region and in other cities across the country. And lastly, like on just this benefits piece, we're seeing people also switch to like parking reservations, shuttle reservations, things that they can easier manage demand and sort of like marry that up with the, the hoteling. Like I can reserve a desk and a parking space or I can reserve and pay for that parking space, hopefully market rate. Um, I can reserve a desk and I can reserve a seat on the shuttle, um, those, types of, those types of things. And then we're seeing a lot of folks move towards how can I offer sort of a flexible subsidy, $100 a month, let's say, to all my employees that can only be used for, you know, alternatives to driving alone, bike share, uh, scooter share, transit, um, lift line, Uber pool, anything that's not driving alone. And um, so we're doing that with a lot of our employers uh, through our software. And I'm excited to see how that impacts, uh, you know, the return to office crowd. And, and if people utilize that subsidy or sort of stick with something, what they know, or maybe what they did during the pandemic, if that was driving alone. And then finally, we're seeing a lot more of a focus on biking and walking through programming, through education, through rewards, through communications, um, less of a passive sort of here's bike racks or here's a bike shower, but really trying to, to promote and message around biking and walking. So the exciting part that I am happy to present today, this is a snapshot. Um, we are doing a presentation. We'll have Duke and Vanderbilt uh, in December talking in detail about these studies. This will just be a little taste of it with some of the findings that they've had and some of the ongoing research. I, I wanted to present it today to give you an idea of how, what research is being done in this space um, and how we could potentially collaborate on that. And I have the permission from our colleagues at the Center for Advanced Hindsight. Joey Sherlock is the lead researcher from, from Duke. Um, and so let's dive into it. First and foremost, I'm just going to show these all. There we go. Uh, these are the three theories, you know, that, that these studies that I'm about to talk about really focus in on. Um, one of them is that pain of payment. Think looking at how can we make the pain of paying for parking more, you know, more salient, like make that loss really visible to the end user. Then the second one, of course, is that sunk cost effect, the monthly parking permit that we all just hope would die. Uh, where we're really looking at how can we, what's the impact when we shift to a daily parking model instead of a monthly parking model. Um, and then finally, looking at that status quo bias, either what you see other people doing as daily, you know, as parking, driving alone, or just what you are used to, and you've already decided to drive, park, and pay for parking. How likely are you to continue that? How can we disrupt that status quo bias? So we started with a lab study, and I guess I may not have made this clear. So Duke is running the research. Vanderbilt is the case study, similar to in Melissa's presentation, how the case study was UW. Um, so Vanderbilt students and graduate students and staff are the, the case study. Um, and then Loom is just the software where all the data is coming from, where the communications are being done, uh, where the parking policies are enforced and pricing for different groups, all of that you know, back end stuff. So that's where, where each of the players sit. So the first study was a lab study that was uh, really focusing on how we frame the daily commute. And so this was a hypothetical scenario where um, posed to state preferred mode of transport for commuting, followed by a survey on commuting habits and demographic info. So this was a hypothetical suburban to urban commute. And there were six conditions for the scenario framing. So there was the control, which started with the stated at the top driving alone as sort of the stated preference and then listed kind of getting 
the least sustainable to more sustainable at the bottom. And we'll look at these in a sec. Uh, then they simply reverse the order to see what impact it does when you list driving alone, the norm last, getting rid of that status quo. And then they did it with four different lenses. So one that looks at calories, one that looks at productivity and things that you can do, you know, when you're not driving alone in a given commute mode, one that listed financial cost, and then one that listed CO2 emissions in that reverse ordering. And there were 815 participants via MTurk, all of them US based. So these were the four experiment conditions. So we had cost, emissions, calories, and productivity. So you can see this is where, you know, that's that reverse ordering. So the control was the opposite order with no frame. Um, but you can see cost wise, okay, well, this is free. Here's what this costs. Emissions wise, showing you how much you will emit or not emit, giving your mode choice, calories that you will burn, and then productivity, you know, sort of giving you these other things that you could do during these commutes, um, either getting exercise or reading, talking on the phone to somebody, uh, listening to a podcast. So from that study, all treatment conditions significantly increase the likelihood of stating a preference for an alternative mode, not, not driving alone, versus the control. So even just that reverse ordering <laughs> made a big impact. The second, the other finding is that the one that had the most impact overall was the CO2 emissions plus reverse ordering, which significantly increased the likelihood versus just reverse ordering alone. So keep that in mind, environmental frame in a lab study had the biggest impact. Now we'll do some field studies. <laughs> so I'm not gonna go into detail of each of these. I'm just gonna kind of give you this overview and then the next slide says, here's what they found. Uh, but again, in December, we'll, we'll go into the, the nitty gritty and the details. Um, but yeah, so we had three different field studies. The first one was on emails. So using what they learned from the framing study in the lab, they put that into action to test it in the field. Does the environmental frame really have as big of an impact? Does reverse ordering have an impact? And they did this to, to get people, to get students, faculty, and staff to opt into the daily parking program rather than purchasing an annual pass. So we'll come back, back to that. The second one was on the impact of the daily parking policy. So how is someone who is in the daily parking program and someone who they who opted to be in it, but they said, sorry, we didn't have enough space. Um, how, how are their driving uh, behaviors different throughout the year? This one's on hold because they were going to do it in, in fall of 2020. And then there was like no one commuting. So we're doing it right now, fall of 2021, since there are much more commuters coming to campus. And then the third one is the impact of parking receipts. So making that pain of payment really salient. And uh, in this scenario, they give you either a daily reminder, sort of like when you take a lift ride and you immediately get, you just spent $15 on your lift ride. Um, that kind of concept where you get a notification right after you've driven either on a daily basis, a weekly basis, or a monthly basis saying, here's how much you've spent on parking. And then saying, here are your other options, by the way. So, just really brief finding summary in the lab, the financial frame and environment frame were most effective, but the environment frame was the top reason that people said that they were choosing a specific commute that wasn't driving alone. In reality, in the email study, turns out the financial frame had the biggest impact on those opting to choose the daily parking versus the annual parking pass. I think that's an interesting finding. I know I very much, I used to do pro-environmental behavior change research, and I know there's often a lot of intent there, not always followed by action, and it seems to be at least stating that here, financial has a bigger impact in what we, how we actually behave. Um, the policy study, uh, that's the one I mentioned, needs to be run again this fall because of the lack of commuting in fall of 2020. The receipt study is still in progress right now as people uh, commute and drive. Uh, but it seems to be trending. It seems to be looking like the daily loss aversion uh, it is sticking true here and having the biggest impact, the daily receipts. And the other summary I was told to note is that much more research is needed, um, which we offer a few ideas here. I'm not going to 
dive into this because of time, um, but incremental pricing, pre-commitments, and incentive matching are all research areas of interest that we might do with Duke. Um, this is the head researcher out of Duke University, Joey Sherlock. Um, he'll be presenting in December. And I will close it out there as I know we are tight on time. Thank you very much, Kelly. You know, I wish we had more time for all the presenters. Uh, fantastic work, a lot of interesting ideas. So hopefully we have more time in the future. But today to um, end this session, uh, let's have an opportunity for the audience to ask a, a few questions. I will start by conveying a question from Ko Kapka. Uh, Kapka. Um, the question is uh, uh, actually following Kelly's uh, presentation quite well. Uh, can anyone comment on the expected change in future needs for parking? Are companies, universities, or communities uh, talking about change in supply and demand for parking? Uh, are employees talking about changing parking pricing or parking programs? Okay. So anybody, uh, of course, including Kelly. From an employer perspective, we're seeing that employers want to have less parking, whether they own it or lease it, and which is great. And hopefully it also correlates with a reduction in drive alone rate, not just a hybrid schedule, meaning same amount of people are still driving. Um, the other thing we're seeing that's like the biggest challenge that, that maybe we don't always think about is parking operators. Uh, they are really like the known revenue. They like to charge. They've got a great model where they charge you for a monthly rate, but then if you don't show up, they can sell it on the street, double book it. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of employers try to like band together where they lease parking to sort of force a uh, parking operator to change to it, let them do flexible daily permits because they want to switch to daily parking. So hopefully we can make that happen across the country. Okay, um, let's see if from the audience, are there questions? Uh, feel free to type them in the Q&A and I will convey. You know, while people are, might still be thinking, I think that um, future solutions to various transportation challenges really require collaboration, interaction among various stakeholders from different perspectives. And I really am happy to see this particular session that is happening. I mean, individually and collectively in this session, we are bringing different perspectives, different experiences and thoughts. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Let's see if, um, if there are other questions. Uh, let me raise one for, for everybody. So um, given the remaining barriers uh, to uh, public transit, which is clearly shown in um, both the uh, data and survey, survey data presented by Kelly and Jeff, and I'm sure Melissa is also thinking about that. Um, what are the nature of the remaining barriers that seem to prevent about a quarter uh, of uh, prior transit riders to not want to come back to transit and what we can do about it? I like to hear everybody's thoughts. Oh, I, I quickly add one comment. I, I, I'm not sure if that is a, just a temporary trend or it's going to be a long-term trend. I hope it's just temporary, like, uh, you know, maybe a year or two and then everything back to normal after COVID. Um, uh, but I think certainly COVID will have some maybe medium term impact to travel behavior and uh, also the transit use. Uh, but I'm not clear myself like how long that will last. But it's interesting to look into. Any other thought beyond what Jeff said regarding that? 
I share a similar sentiment to Jeff. I think for us at the University of Washington as an employer, it's really we're trying to see uh, and consistently track where is our transit usage at and is this just uh, you know something that will consistently improve as, as more time passes. Um, but we're also in this new era where more folks have the ability to telework across our institution. And so for us too, that, that is uh, adding a lot of, adding uh, more unknowns to sort of what is this long-term uh, look like for us. Yeah, well, I, I'm happy to hear the optimistic view from both of you. I also think about the world inertia when people switch, you know, to to drive drive alone. That may become a new initial, and what extra effort, I guess, would be taken, uh, would be required to to overcome that for just for a thought. And I like also convey uh, a question from Ying Hai uh, regarding the VMT reduction. What kinds of data? were used for the calculations? Was the COVID-19 countermeasure policies considered in the calculation, which uh, really was directed to Bryce and Jeff? Um, Bryce, would you please? <laughs> yeah, let me try to answer that. So the VMT calculations are the direct outputs of our model. So it's the result of all the choices that people make um, about which routes they're gonna take. Um, uh, and a lot of these were asserted assumptions that we were testing. So, you know, it depends on which scenario might represent um, the different countermeasures. So that's why we kind of chose four different scenarios that we're taking a look at to see what magnitudes of working from home or shifting to other modes might happen and what are the impacts of those because we don't particularly, we're not measuring, you know, this is a, a measure that we're including in scenario one or the other, it's just kind of general ranges. So it's it's all part of it, but it's a little more generic the way that those scenarios were designed. Does that kind of go with your thinking, Jeff? Yes, thank you, Bryce. Yeah. Okay, well, I noticed that we actually passed the time. So unfortunately, we needed to end it here. Uh, again, I thank all the panelists for your really excellent presentations and thank all the participants um, for, for your interest and participation. Uh, I look forward to have more opportunities to talk to each of you about various issues which really are important um, for, for us to um, have a normal um, uh, urban uh, transportation systems supporting normal operation of the economy and the society. And with that, thank you again, uh, everybody. Take care. Good to see you here. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.